it's not even something that has stopped with the boomers. Well, one of the uh, aspects that I got interested in when I started to try to look into, like, you know, how were the boomers made? Try to remember back when I actually made the video on the boomers in the original series is the um, after the war in America, uh, you know, after World War II, there was a massive project. In fact, I think it started under FDR, but it was then continued. There was a massive project to move essentially white people out of the cities and out of the inner cities and into the suburbs. And, you know, because one of the questions that people, nobody ever asks like, is like, well, like talking about like Levittown type stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, the question that nobody ever asks is how is it that all the black people live in massive cities in America? Like, oh, right. Why are the cities are like overrun? And it, it, there was actually a project where they strongly encouraged uh, folk to move to the suburbs, right? Um, but part, it was kind of like a lifestyle package deal where, you know, you've got your, you've got your 2.4 house uh, in the, you know, think of like Edward Scissorhands or something, you know, the, right. the perfect neighborhood. It's all, it's a residential area. It's safe. Um, but of course, you then have to go to the mall, the new out of town mall to do all your to do all your shopping, and oh look at the look at all the mod cons that we've got now, like the the washing machine or the mm -hmm. you know the, uh, the the vacuum cleaner or whatever, and it was all sold as a kind of new convenient lifestyle as a as a package in the in the this was in the nineteen fifties, and. Um, one of the one of the uh, things to think about, I guess, is that many uh, boomers grew up in what was effectively a, an artificial environment. If that makes any sense, i.e., though you know, like the nineteen fifties, the Pat Buchanan valorizes, right, um, or like when boomers think of their own childhood. Like I'm talking like conservative. Uh, what do you call them? Um, not patcons, paleo paleocons, right? That when the paleocons are thinking of like trying to recreate the 1950s, <clears throat> um, I, I I think a lot of the time people don't realize just just the fact that that environment that they grew up in that was a was actually a very short run thing. Like when people think of 1950s America, there were huge government controls holding all that in place. Um, and that that the suburb was a new thing that that was created at that point, um, which it, it, I don't know. It's just one of those things I find. Well, it's like um, yeah. that 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 uh, that event that happened a couple of weeks ago where that guy beheaded his dad and on <laughs> and showed the video on YouTube. And I don't know if you remember that. Uh, that took place in Levittown, Pennsylvania, and Levittown, uh, Pennsylvania, was the prototype of those communities. Uh, there was a, a, a Jewish land developer, uh, something Levitt, I forget his, his first name. And uh, what he was doing is he was repurposing a lot of the uh, 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 manufacturing power and, uh, that the United States had post-World War II to mass produce uh, these homes you're talking about, these mid-century modern homes and the, the like the Edward Scissorhand uh, type homes. And so Levittown, Pennsylvania was the prototype of this, where he, he pumped out a bunch of these, these homes and advertised it as, you know, this is the, you know, you can, you can get a, a brand new home at this affordable price. And they, you know, sure they all look kind of the same, but you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it, it's much better than living in an apartment in the city, especially given the, uh, uh, the, the, the migration of blacks into these larger cities. Uh, and, you know, so you had white flight that was already kind of taking place already as uh, blacks left the South and and uh, and, and to, to seek out either jobs in bigger cities or social uh, programs and resources. And so you, it, it was this perfect storm where whites fled the, the cities and moved into these towns, these new developments, this new way of creating uh, mass producing suburbs, these McMansions as they are now because they still exist. They're just, uh, now they're made of stucco and cardboard and, and, uh, you know, but they're all over the, they're all over the country. And, and many, many, including myself, a lot of white kids grew up in neighborhoods like that. Um, and, and so you're right in that it was like this fresh out of the package, uh, neighborhood where, you know, their, their, uh, home was brand new. 
Uh, and because the all these new residents had moved to the area, the 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 school they went to was brand new. The, uh, the the shopping mall that they shopped at was brand new. Everything was brand new. It was uh, like any of these. If you go to the the outskirts of any large metropolitan area, uh, it's the same sort of a thing. These new developments, you know, where you, they all have these you know names that have nothing to do with anything that's actually around. You know, like. Uh, you know, like Rancho Vista, you know, there's no ranch, you know, there's no view of a ranch anywhere, you know, or, or, uh, you know, they, a lot of, especially in California, they all have like Spanish names, you know, and, uh, you know, like, uh, Verde Village or <laughs> it's just like, okay. Mm-hmm. And, and so you have like these, these walled gardens, basically, you know, it's basically like the Apple app store of housing where it's literally is surrounded by this giant cinder block wall and uh, in many cases even has like a gate at the front with a, uh, a, a full-time security guard who's paid for by the, uh, uh, the HOA and all this other stuff. But yeah, in the, in the beginning, they, they were the first to live in these kinds of uh, uh, communities that, that really isolated them from the realities of the rest of the country. And, uh, and as a result, a lot of these businesses would move to these communities. So in addition to them going to these brand new schools where everyone was, uh, it was pretty ethnically homogenous in a lot of ways, uh, and, and going to these uh, restaurants and, and stores that were all ethnically homogenous, you might have like the token this or that or whatever, but mostly it was the, 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 the white residents of that community that that uh, went to these places, but you also had these businesses pop up uh, because they now had all these workers and they thought, well, you know, are you tired of commuting to the city? Let's just move a, you know, an Intel or a, uh, a Motorola plant uh, in, you know, close to one of these, uh, 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 you know, Levittowns and you can all work there and you're gonna have the same ethnic reality at at where you work as you do at the, at the store and everywhere else. And, uh, and what they don't, what, what I don't think boomers quite appreciate is that wasn't what the reality was for a lot of other parts of, of the country, you know? Uh, and so when they would watch these riots on television, like the race riots that took place, especially during and, and after uh, 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 Martin Luther King's life, uh, it was all very, they were all very detached. And so because it wasn't happening in their neighborhood, and they didn't have the internet. There was no way to verify any of the information being reported to them. If the newspaper said, "Oh, it was a you know a peaceful march and and they were attacked you know unnecessarily by these uh, white police officers," oh, I got Churro here at the door. I don't know if you can hear him. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can hear that. Uh, I've, yeah, <laughs> there's. I got a stray cat that uh, I started feeding, and now he, it's like he knows when I'm live, and this is what he does. Uh, but. I'll let him in here in a second, but the, uh, it, 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 to them, it was, it was easier for them to swallow the, the official story. Cause there was no way to verify, uh, the information. And there was, you know, if every official, uh, media outlet was saying the same thing and they were, then, uh, you know, why wouldn't they fought the belief, swallow the, nar- uh, the narrative whole? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, 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 one of one of the issues that that I that I have, Devon, in in trying to write this book is to is is actually the difference in experience between Britain and America, right? Because um, the way Britain experienced the the post war period and the boomer period is so, is somewhat different, and that you can actually see it in the contrast between the housing situation in America that we've just talked through and what and what happened here, which is that. Um, you know, there were all these old Victorian streets um, that still existed, like Victorian housing that a lot of people lived in, especially like the working class. And the government basically bulldozed them. They literally just destroyed whole neighborhoods, whole, like whole streets, and the housing was just torn down. But rather, re- rather than relocating all these people to suburbia, as happened in America, here, a lot of those people were just dragooned into those awful kind of brutalist high-rise flats. I don't know if you've ever seen them, those kind of high-rise, almost kind of like almost like Soviet-style oh, yeah. um, apartment blocks um, with, uh, 
you know, the kind of had like modernist design behind them. There are interesting documentaries about this by um, not Adam Curtis, but uh, what's his name? Nick. Who's the guy who made that Nirvana documentary? Um, Nick. Uh, there's one called Nick Who Cares by Nick. Uh, just trying to remember his name now. Somebody in the chat. Well, Nick Broomfield. There we go. Nick Broomfield. He was um, he was famous later for making music kind of documentaries, but in the seventies he was really interested in um, this the fact that they basically destroyed communities that existed, cohesive communities that uh, were there before the war. After the war, they basically wrecked them all and moved those people into these horrible, brutalist buildings. Um, but how they allocated it was unclear. But let's say you were an old woman or something, you were living on that street, and every morning you woke up and you spoke to your neighbour. Um, <laughs> um, those two women wouldn't go to the same building. They they separate. So the they literally just destroy the communities. Um, kind of a hateful Labour Party project, uh, kind of like proper socialism, you know. Um, right. But I mean, I one of the things that I'm kind of interested in, in is how that boomer mindset that comes from the suburbs that we were talking about, like the the people who the kind of carefree attitude that grows up around those, you know, those problems are over there. It's not real to them or they can just read that they were mostly peaceful protests in 1967 or, or whatever, you know, um, literally when they burned down Detroit. <laughs> right. um, what I'm interested in is how that mindset basically kind of starts exporting itself and migrates over here because boomers in this country basically have the same attitude. Um, and there's a, uh, how can I put it? Like, I, I think what one of the things that people get um, upset with boomers about is the fact that they never take any, any form of like responsibility for anything. Right. Um, in fact, there was an, there was a, there was an example today. I was talking to my dad because I've been uh, sorting out pension. I was sort just so happened I was trying to sort out some pension stuff earlier on, and um, I was on the phone to him, and he and he said um, he said, of course, uh, I don't know if you uh, don't know if you guys will get a state pension. I was like, yeah, just like everything else, you guys will get it, and we and we won't. And he said, yeah, but we 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 worked hard for it. I, pay, I paid 150 grand into international insurance or whatever. So, you know, we deserve it. I was like, yeah, but what, we pay taxes too. <laughs> but it's just like there's always that disconnect when you talk to anyone of that generation where it's like, you know, for the, they pull themselves up by the bootstraps, but, you know, uh, they, they, they can't see that. Um, how can I say? Um, that in a way they can't see that the next generation on somehow has a more difficult has a more difficult situation um so i think that's where a lot of uh you know superficial kind of boomer resentment comes from is the, the fact that actual individual boomers don't um don't seem to take responsibility 